All right, it's time to learn Tableau. So begin by downloading this data set right here, or it's also in the description of this video. So download, and then let's open up Tableau for the first time. I'll go ahead and pull this up. Now, if this is your first time opening Tableau, and also I'm assuming that you've either also either got your student or educational license key and entered that in, or if not, you can still start on these videos by just using the two-week trial version. And it should bring you to this screen if you're on the desktop version, although you might not see these options right here because you haven't created any projects yet. So with Tableau, we can begin by either connecting to a data source or opening or creating a workbook. And they have some uh, templates in here already, but we're not going to go through these yet. For starters, I want to begin by connecting to that data set that we just downloaded. So the file we downloaded is an Excel file. It's .xls, but you know Excel has a, quite a few different file types, xlsx, xlsm, and some others. There's also text files, which includes things like .txt, but also .csv files. And then we can connect to, as you can see, a variety of other things, including cloud sources. Um, sorry, by the way, this is how we'll go through and open up and find a particular uh, document or file that we downloaded. But there's also cloud sources down here are servers. These are databases that live uh, on a computer other than our own, and there's tons of different types here. Uh, Azure SQL Server databases, I use Postgres and Azure SQL Server a lot. Um, other non-relational database types, I'm not going to get into all these. Uh, you need a good database class to go through a lot of these things, but uh, some common ones, um, I use uh, Snowflake and Spark a lot with data warehousing projects. Um, uh, regular My My Microsoft SQL Server if you're not on Azure. Anyway, we won't worry about all that quite yet. For now, we're just going to connect to Excel. So click on that, open this up, and let's go find that file that we just downloaded, Sample Superstore, right here. All right, when that opens up, it takes us now to this data source view. And notice we have six objects in here. Let's just open up, first of all, that file so you can see what it looks like beforehand. I'm going to bring this up here and open up Sample Superstore. Bring it into the view. All right. So we have an Excel file. I'm going to zoom in a bit with a bunch of columns and rows, row ID, order ID, order date. So this is a data set about, about orders. Now notice we have three sheets down here, orders, people, which is not very many, here we go, and then returns. So we're going to assume here that these people place these orders and these returns. So uh, right now I don't have a, a clear connection between them, but if I come over here to orders, let's see what types of, all right, I have customer right here, customer name, these probably refer to some of those people over in that other table. So we'll get to that in a little bit in Tableau, but right now it looks like I've got a lot of people that aren't necessarily included in this table over here. That's all right though, no problem. Um, and then returns, looks like here I've got data on, zoom way in, pull this up. Okay, an order ID and then just simply an indicator of whether or not it was returned. It looks like these are all just gonna be yeses because these were the returns. So I'm guessing this order ID right here connects up to this order ID right here. Now Excel doesn't make those connections for us, but back here in Tableau, we've got a set of sheets, but then it looks like these things are repeated right here. Well, these are what we call named ranges in Excel. I'm actually gonna pull those back up really quick so I can show you what I mean. Let me bring this back up. I shouldn't have closed that right away. So in here, you can find named ranges in Excel by going to this address bar and clicking on one of the buttons and it'll show you, hey, we have a named range called orders. And if I select that, it's all of this data. Well, what's the difference between this and the order sheet? Well, a named range ends at a particular place on the sheet. I wonder if I can scroll over, there we go. So you can see this range doesn't include column V, but it does include A through U. It also, I'm guessing, doesn't include, if I scroll down, there we go, it doesn't include rows 9996 or below. So the named range is a portion of a sheet, and you can have multiple named ranges on a sheet. 
And sometimes in Excel, that's really useful to have a named range for a variety of reasons. I just wanted you to recognize and understand what it meant by these down here. Technically, it really, for, the, for uh, Tableau's purposes, it makes no difference whether we use a, a sheet or a named range because each of our sheets only has one named range on them. So we could refer to either one. I'm just gonna simply click and drag a table out here and it gives me a preview of my data down here. I can see in Excel all of those columns that I just had. Um, and I also it then converts them into what it calls fields here. And I've got a list of these row, these field names across the top as field names down the row. And it also gives me some um, other metadata. So it says physical table, meaning what table does, the, does this refer to? It's the orders table. It's getting this from this named range right here. Remote filled, well, let's not worry about that quite yet. For now, what I wanna do is look at some other metadata. It lets us know there's 24 fields or columns across 9,994 rows. And it uh, right now, well, let's hold off on that one for right now too. The next thing I wanna show you is that I get these data types both down here and across the top. Notice the pound sign here or the hashtag, whatever you wanna call it. This means this is a numeric data type, it's a number. Now, it doesn't differentiate in this case between a whole number or a decimal number. Here, ABC means it's a text data field, which can include numbers and text. So if it includes anything that's not a number, including special characters, it's going to default to text. Here, this means I've got a date field, date field, and you can see text, text, text. This little world means it's a geographic data type. One of the cool things about Tableau over something as simple like Excel for visualization is it handles mapping or geographic data types and automatically recognizes that these refer to a place. Same with city, same with uh, state and postal code. These are all geographic data types we'll be able to use. So more, uh, more uh, text data types and then a few more numeric data types. And notice that these are decimals, but it uses the same pound sign as it does here for whole numbers. So for now, uh, what else can we do on this pane? Well, we can connect data sources together. So we know that there were some returns that referred to orders. So right here, it automatically created a line here. It looked at both data sources and tried to guess whether there's a field in one data source that maps to a field in the other data source. If you're familiar with relational databases, think of this as a primary key foreign key relationship. So notice here in the returns table, notice we now have a preview of returns. If I click on returns, it'll highlight it and show me that data specifically, or I can click back on orders and it shows me the order data. Let's go back to returns here and it says, all right, you've got uh, two fields. And right here, it gives you a preview of what it's guessing. It says, we think that the order ID field in the returns table connects to or returns, it's kind of double meaning there, connects to or returns the order ID table in, uh, the orders uh, field. So, oh, actually, I'm sorry, that's not referring, I gotta click on, that's just giving you the remote field here. This is doing the same thing. Let me click on the relationship. There we go. That was a little confusing. Here's my orders table, order ID, returns order ID from the orders uh, returns table. So it's saying that these two things equal each other, and that's how the tables connect. Now notice there's some other operators too. We'll worry about those on another time. Um, right now, if you Again, if you understand relational databases, this gives you an idea of what we call the cardinality. That means an order ID in the orders table can be referred to many times in the returns table. So an order, it thinks an order can be returned more than once. All right, well, that might make sense. We've got the same order ID appearing multiple times in here. And then an order ID in the returns table can appear, it thinks, many times over in the orders table. Now, you can, sometimes it'll get this right and sometimes it'll get it wrong and you can force it to one or the other, but it will try to make an assumption based on what it sees, what type of data it sees in both table. So if it's assuming many to many, there must be some order IDs in the orders table that appear more than once. Well, let's take a look. Actually, it looks like that's true. This order ID appears here twice. Let's scroll across and see if we can find any data that's different across these. Oh, sure enough, right here. So we've got a subcategory for this order, bookcases and chairs. That it, so we've got two different values here on uh, the same order. That means 
that we've got one order ID, probably, I'm guessing, with two products on it. So if we come over here, sure enough, in fact, we've got two different product names, two different sales prices, two different quantities, discounts, and even profit margin on those. So essentially, each record in this table, even though it's called orders, that tells me that each row isn't unique. It doesn't represent, sorry, a single order. It represents a line item on an order. That's important to understand. This is very common when we're dealing with data science tasks or data mining or visualization. We do what's called, we uh, denormalize data, where rather than breaking it apart into separate tables, if you're familiar with relational databases, we do that to eliminate redundancy. We actually combine them back together again and we get redundancy, meaning this order ID and order date, ship date, all these things are repeated so that we can keep track of each individual product on the same data set. This is useful for creating visualizations and other analyses. Anyway, let's pull in our last table here, people, and let's see what it's going to guess about people, how that's connected. So it finds these uh, different persons and it believe it uh, thinks here that actually it's not person it thinks that matches up it finds region and it thinks that region matches over here with people uh, sorry re uh, region over in the orders table well, let's take a look at the orders table and see what region is if we scroll there's country region oh here's region sure enough there's data here like south that appears to match up with people over here well, normally I don't think that's the way those tables would want to match up. I'm thinking that they really want to match person with the person over here or customer name and orders, but I don't know if that actually matches. I would have to look through on people and see if there's someone here like Anna Andriati that matches with people over there. But let's click on the relationship between them. And let's see if this will work. I'm going to change customer name here as the field we want to match up with person over here. In addition, I can control what they call performance options here. So this, if, again, if you're familiar with relational databases, refers to what they call it, what we mean by the cardinality of this relationship between orders and people, meaning uh, as before, it, this shows how many, we already talked about how many records in one table can relate to how many records in another table. But down here, what we have is what uh, we often refer to as whether this is a left, right, or inner join. Meaning, uh, do all of the records in orders have to have records that match up in people or vice versa? And if we leave it to the default of some records match, that means this is what we call an outer join, where it allows all records from both tables, but matches up those that can be matched where customer name equals person on these two different tables but keeps everything else. If we were to change this to all records match, then that means it's only going to keep the records that ha that where the person over here equals customer name over there. But for now, we're going to leave this to sum so it includes all of the data. All right, so we've got our data source connected uh, and pulled in. Uh, just so you know, we can add other data sources by connecting to live cloud sources or other files. We can bring them all in over here on the pane, but we'll keep this example simple and stop here for now.